So I begin this video by lining up my hose clamps. I'm putting new hoses and new clamps on all the things. The old ones didn't leak, but hoses are cheap, clamps are cheap, and peace of mind is in short supply these days. Here you see me put in the lower radiator hose and the expansion tank hose. So I'm going to try and jam in the rest of the reassembly into this video. So expect this video to demolish more footage than any other video, maybe even ever. All jokes aside, I do have some more cool footage piling up from a recent endeavor that I want to share with you. I've got one short video with the ML that is a very reasonable DIY and I also have something special that I did with my C220, so expect more goodies to come in the near future. Because of a messed up internet order, I ended up with 4 meters of spare overflow tube. So I decided to solve a small convenience issue. The coolant expansion tank's overflow dumps on the wheel arch, which seems like a fine proposition at first. However, if you put too much coolant into the system, the overflow quietly runs down the wheel arch under the air box and pools under the auxiliary water pump. So now, when you check your engine for leaks and whatnot, you think you've got a leaking auxiliary water pump. To mitigate that, I ran a new overflow tube along the fender, under the headlight and into the wheel splash guard, where there was a convenient little drain hole already made. This puts the overflow far from other sources of coolant, so now I can know right away if I've got a leak or if it's just excess coolant draining out. And then it goes down underneath. So just gotta cut it to an acceptable length, and I've got a new uh, got a new overflow. Do I have too much spare time on my hands? Yes. Fit the top radiator hose, remembering not to over tighten the clamps. While I was there I changed the belt tensioner, the damper and the pulley. Nothing special to note here, just remember to install a damper with the piston end pointing downwards. Reconnect the vacuum and power lines to the vacuum solenoid at the front of the engine. The top bolt also serves as a ground, so be sure not to forget it. If you've removed your alternator, be sure to install it now and torque it up. Connect the engine coolant temperature sensor and then install the accessory belt. Now I'm going to mix my coolant. For that of course you'll need coolant and distilled water. I'm going with Xerix G05 as my coolant since it's readily available and it's cheap. Distilled water is likewise very cheap and you can make yourself way more coolant than for the price of pre-mixed stuff. If you can't find Xerix G05, the genuine MB coolant is usually pretty cheap at dealerships, but if that's also not an option, just be sure to use a coolant with the MB325.0 specification. 8 liters should be plenty enough for this. Even though the system has a higher capacity, a lot of coolant stays in the heating circuit. There is no need to have a higher concentration of coolant than 50%, unless you live somewhere where temperatures drop below 35 Celsius. Boiling protection is not given by coolant concentration, it is given by pressurization of the cooling system. And water has nearly twice higher specific heat capacity than coolant, so a higher concentration actually reduces cooling performance. Stick the air box back in its spot. Push down on it so the pegs can pop into the bushings. Now you gotta drop the fan shroud back into its spot. Make sure that all of its legs sit in the tap so that it's mounted flush with the radiator. Apply some medium strength Loctite to the threads of the fan clutch. Screw the engine cooling fan back on. The threads are reversed so you'll have to spin the nut counterclockwise to get it on. Be sure to make the nut tight. You don't want your engine cooling fan to loosen up. It's recommended to let the Loctite cure for at least 12 hours before starting the engine. This will ensure that the fan does not back out. I made myself a new thermostat to expansion tank hose using some 8mm heater hose, which is the international way of saying 5 sixteenths of an inch. Before you forget, uh, reconnect your alternator because I, you know, I bolted it back up to the engine and then proceeded to do everything else. And I would have been in for a surprise tomorrow if my alternator was still disconnected. And once you've got that done, time to fill everything up with coolant. I would love to have one of those vacuum cooling system filling systems, but since my budget for such fancy equipment is, well, non-existent, I've devised a different method to bleed the cooling system of air. More on that later though. Your thermostat may have a bleed screw, but mine didn't. It just has a blank spot where a bleed screw could have been. Now it's time to put the valve cover on. It's good to install a new gasket and the new spark tube seals. You have to pay extra attention to the back of the valve cover when installing it. The two curved edges at the back actually seal in the oil pressure that's flowing through the camshaft to lubricate the journals. So you have to take your time and make sure that the gasket doesn't slip out while installing the valve cover. Because if it does, you'll have a massive oil leak. The spark tube seals will give a little bit of resistance as they come down, so give the valve cover a push when it's nearly all the way down to seat it properly. 
The bolts don't go on very tight. Just pay attention to the gasket. When it's squishing against the cylinder head, it's time to stop. Screw in some new spark plugs. Follow the torque specification on the box the spark plug came in. It's one of those things that does not need to be over tightened. The spark plug is sealed by a crush washer, and once it's crushed, there's no need to keep screwing the spark plug in. You're just risking damage to the spark plug or the cylinder head. Plug the spark plugs to the correct ignition coils and route the wires neatly. The M111 came with a handful of different ignition systems, so figuring out what goes where is up to you. If you have the wires and wasted spark ignition like I do, I'll just throw in a note here. The Bosch wires are not very good. The OEM wires were made by Beru and were excellent, but sadly they are difficult to find as a set. I've been running the Carlin STI wires for a few months now and they are working very well. They seem to be built much better than the Bosch wires. The set is a generic set though, so the wires are a little bit longer than they need to be, but they can still be routed neatly. Install the spark plug cover. Connect the vacuum hoses and the brake booster hose. Install the throttle body boot. Install the front cover. Install the air intake tube and the mass airflow sensor. Connect the mass airflow sensor, fit your favorite brand of air filter and fit the rest of the airbox piping. Fill up with oil and start your engine. It's probably a good idea to pull the fuel relay out and let it crank for a little bit to build oil pressure, but strictly speaking it's not necessary. The block's oil galleries are still full. But I didn't do that, I was getting too excited about finally starting up the engine. Besides, I sprayed a liter's worth of oil and everything during reassembly, so I wasn't too worried. Note, my camera's rather crappy microphone made the startup sound a lot worse than it really was. There were some noises, but they were all accounted for. The camshaft adjuster rattles until it is full of oil, then it quiets right down. It's not normally supposed to do that, it's an age-related failure, but as far as I can gather, it never becomes a worse problem than just being noisy. But I'll replace that sometime soon. The rest of the noises came from the lifters. Between me cleaning the lifters and me installing them, they had bled down completely and they took a bit of time to get silenced, but once they did, the engine ran quieter than ever.